Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Board of Regents meeting on the wonderful campus of Dakota State University. Uh, President Schieffer, unfortunately, particularly for me, um, is uh, under the weather and will not be with us today, and I guess tomorrow is kind of iffy, but uh, I've been pressed into service. I think the last time I presided over a group this large, I was handling uh, arraignment court. So, welcome President Griffith. Thank we're you very much. To, we're happy to be here. Thank you. Um, welcome to Dakota State University. Let me get my slides going here. So welcome to Dakota State University. We're delighted to have you here on campus with us and especially to have a chance to show you firsthand some of the impressive advancements happening here at DSU. DSU is rising, and we're rising at the speed of technology, which, as you know, is getting faster and faster and not happening. <laughs> Come on. We're rising at the speed of technology. <laughs> <laughs> we always have Tyler here. He's my backup. He's always there. Don't go We'd too far away. <laughs> <laughs> he promised to be here while I'm talking, which, as you know, is getting faster and faster all the time. DSU is rising in academics, research, and workforce and economic development for South Dakota. And the quality of our campus facilities is rising. I'm also pleased that you'll have the opportunity during your time with us to tour the new Mad Labs and I'm especially pleased that you'll be able to see firsthand how DSU faculty have seized on the concept of the Mad Labs and created a truly unique and innovative set of research clusters and institutes. Each of them offers great promise and reflects the impressive expertise of DSU faculty. In addition, ideas are flowing from lab to lab and new research problems and approaches are emerging. Our list of partners continues to grow, and their engagement and investment alongside that of our faculty is already providing unprecedented opportunities for DSU students to be learning at the leading edge of technological innovation. We've also had to deal with rising above, quite literally this fall, Mother Nature's vagaries this year. In 2019, we've had to close the campus for life-threatening cold weather, an astounding South Dakota blizzard in April, and then, just a few weeks ago, what's being called a 500, I know it says 100, but people are saying it's more than the 100-year flood in Madison. On September the 10th and 11th, we had over a foot of rain in 24 hours. Added to already full lakes and streams, the water overflowed every bank trying to contain it and rushed into Madison, closing roads, shutting down power, and flooding the city. Thankfully, most of the campus suffered only minor water damage, though our baseball and softball complex was flooded. But more than 100 DSU faculty, staff, and students were directly impacted. Many are still struggling to recover their homes. Amazingly, there were no deaths or major injuries, but there was significant damage and loss for homes and businesses in our community. We immediately saw what it was like when DSU rises up above adversity. Students, faculty, and staff swiftly mobilized to help the community. Various student groups endlessly made and distributed sandbags, helped evacuate the 82 residents of Bethel Lutheran Homes to the community center in three hours, and then, two days later, moved them all safely back home and helped lo load six dump trunks, dump trucks of water-destroyed clothing from a Lutheran church's basement clothes closet, among many other activities. A few days later, we held, a, held our scheduled annual DSU Day of Service, our annual thank you to our host community. 831 DSU faculty, staff, and students together provided 2,802 and a half hours of assistance around the area. This is the equivalent of providing the Madison community with 70 additional employees, each putting in a full 40-hour work week. We also reached out to the Madison community to help us expand our homecoming activities from celebrating Trojan pride and strength to also celebrating Madison area pride and resilience. 
more than 40 community organizations joined with us to put on a free community-wide tailgate event where volunteers collected food, toiletries, and other necessities for those harmed in the flood. DSU then welcomed community members with free admission to the football game for some much needed distraction and great Trojan football, and we won, <laughs> 38 to 21. We followed up with a thank you ad in our local paper encouraging people to support Madison businesses, many of which suffered losses directly or indirectly from the flooding. Dakota State's visibility and our visual identity have also risen. I hope you're enjoying our new colors, especially our new hexagon logo. The hexagon is a symbol of strength and unity. It's also the most efficient, toughest shape found in nature, not just on Earth, but across the universe. Those of you who may be fans of the movie Avengers Endgame may have noticed that their time travel jump port is made up of hexagons, supporting the idea of powerful advances into the future, certainly consistent with DSU's rising and mission. Human illustrations of DSU's rising and advances into the future abound across campus. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to a few of them through a brief video. Griffin Egner is a student who has helped defend America in cyberspace through a summer internship with Army Cyber. Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Barnes, deputy team leader of the Army Cyber Protection Brigade said, Griffin superbly integrated into our team and worked alongside the top cyber operator. If Griffin represents the caliber and character of Army Cyber interns and future hires, the future looks great for the civilian cohort. One of our alumni, Becky Mutziger, has built on the sense of community and problem-solving opportunities she encountered at Dakota State and expanded it into her professional career. And two of our professors, Chris Olson and Kevin Smith, are transforming the future of education by implementing innovations made possible by robots. So excuse me just a second, I have to come out of this. This summer, I was with the Army Cyber uh, Internship, the Career Exploration and Advancement uh, Internship. Uh, we uh, got to go on two mission sets to uh, the Republic of Korea, um, where I worked on anything from malware analysis to script writing to network analytics, setting up infrastructure, assessing security posture, and then also applying data science to pretty much everything that I did for report writing. It's very rewarding to work on high mission element, um, working for national security. DSU classes line up one-to-one -one with everything that you do in the career workforce. Um, basically, if you have a defensive security class, offensive security class, um, malware class, it all applies to anything that you do. So the DSU education is fantastic. Um, one thing that I really enjoy is that they, they don't give you all the answers by any means, and no university should. They really pride themselves on creating critical thinkers and people that can come up with conclusions themselves. This university is by far one of the best choices I've ever made in my entire life. I've learned so much, and the guidance of my professors, peers, and coworkers um, have really led me to some great places, some great experiences and uh, I can only apply it to the strong foundation that DSU has given me. I graduated from DSU in 1996 and my degree was business administration with a concentration in marketing. I am currently the chief of staff at Lloyd Companies in Sioux Falls and as a chief of staff I oversee the departments of human resources, marketing, IT, safety, administration, training and development. Culture at DSU is, is really something that I think is special. The reason why I say that is I feel like the faculty and staff um, when I was there were they were so kind and I learned just so much from them as far as just a one-on-one -on -one experience um, and that's to me was a huge advantage of one of the things I wanted from a, from a university with my degree. It was a business administration degree but we also were required to even take computer programming classes and I really it just that really helped me understand like a full aspect of all of business from you know what's happening behind that computer to how I'm going to apply these programs to what I'm doing in my day-to-day -day work um, 
you know, from, you know, even just the simple things as Word or Excel. People are a big part of our business too. I'm not just employees, but the community, our clients, our tenants, our residents, everything. And it's how we treat them and the experience we give them. And I, I just feel like DSU helped me do that. I challenge myself to figure it out. And so I think, you know, I was challenged there to figure out programming, so I keep challenging myself today to figure out the new technology, and that's all part of DSU. You know, at DSU, we're always looking for ways to um, bring new technologies to our teachers, give them experiences that are gonna help them in the classroom. And the telepresence robots like Dewey and Cosmo, they're a perfect example of how we've, how we've brought something new and innovative to them with you know, a push and a movement towards more online education. And in South Dakota, where we have a lot of remote areas, um, thinking about ways to reach students with telepresence robots is a pretty powerful tool. And we just try to give our students at DSU experiences with technology tools such as that. I've used Cosmo the Robot to attend faculty meetings, meet with prospective students and their parents, as well as teach some of the classes in the classroom. He's been wonderful for me because I'm able to be on campus and have that presence without leaving the comforts of my home. One of the ways that we've used the telepresence robots is with our online students and specifically with our online graduate students. And what it has allowed them to do is be a part of campus from remote locations. And that's been pretty powerful for them as students to be a part of campus. Um, many of them have never been to campus before and this is a chance for them to really get a sense of what it's like to be here. And on top of that, the students that happen to be in those classes and get to see the telepresence robot being used, they get to see what would this look like if I had one of these in my school and how could I help my own students with a telepresence robot. And so that's been a pretty powerful feature of the robots too. So DSU is a really special place to me. I attended DSU as an undergraduate student. I was a math education major and I was involved in athletics when I was here and I really enjoy DSU because of the, the size of the school, the, the personal um, relationships that I got to you know, develop with my faculty and friends and now to come back as a faculty member um, it's really exciting. I like the fact that we're encouraged um, to be innovative here. Um, we're, we can make, we have a lot of autonomy, we can make decisions about new things and we can try them in our classrooms and we can really have an impact on students. And so I think DSU is just a special place for those reasons. DSU has always been innovative in trying to incorporate the latest technology, not only in what we teach, but we also do that in practice where we use technology to enhance the lives of many people. Um, we're always looking for the next big thing and we want to be leaders in technology in all aspects. And these robots are just one more example of how DSU strives to be innovative. Video, it's another to see it in your own present time and space. So this summer I was with the Army Cyber uh, Internship, the Career Exploration and Advancement. Please join me in welcoming Chris Olson and his telepresence robot Cosmo. Chris is actually currently out of state, but he can join us virtually through Cosmo. Hi there, Chris. So Chris comes to meetings when he's not able to travel in the snow and when it's easier for him to be remote. But he, uh, he, he fulfills all his functions as a, uh, as a professor, his teaching, his uh, advising, and his participation in campus events. Thank you for joining us here today, Chris. Technology changes lives and it continues to change the lives of every one of us here at DSU. DSU faculty, students, staff, alumni and partners continue to push this university forward, leading South Dakota forward and applying the power of cyber to create transformational futures for individuals and organizations across our state, our region, our country and the world. I want to personally thank you, our Board of Regents, for giving us the support and leadership we need to do all that we're doing and will do in the future. Thank you for making it possible for DSU to rise and serve the educational, research, workforce and economic development dreams and innovations of South Dakota. It's a privilege to be part of an endeavor doing so much good and creating so many opportunities for so many. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Griffin.
And thank you again to you and your staff for hosting the Board of Regents. It's not an easy uh, endeavor, and it's very much appreciated. It's always great to be back on this campus. Great. Glad to have you. Thank you. Reports of the Executive Director, inter Interim Actions, Dr. Barron. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Regent Bastian. Um, I'll let you uh, all already peruse the maintenance and re repair projects that, that come under my domain, and so I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, the board and the board office, we've been busy since August. Uh, they're in the board retreat. Uh, most important, uh, we presented our requests for a consideration by the governor for inclusion in her budget, and our number one priority uh, is Dakota's promise. Uh, that's a scholarship program to help those who have, um, uh, who, are, who have high financial need so that we can include more and more students into our opportunities uh, here in the state in South Dakota. We also met with uh, the, the COPS, which is the Council of Presidents and Superintendents. Now, the, the goal of COPS, uh, for those of you who are not a member of that August group and you're here, is to correct, try to create as much work for you as possible in the shortest amount of time. Uh, and we did that. We've managed to do that consistently. Uh, we met with COPS and discussed a variety of topics, what, many of which are represented in, this, in the agenda that we are uh, working with here today. Meanwhile, uh, during COPS, President Griffiths joined us remotely for that meeting while she was here in Madison providing leadership to both the, um, uh, uh, the campus and the community, and, and I was very happy that she was able to join us remotely so that she was able to participate. Uh, we're certainly glad things are getting back to normal uh, and we're here to celebrate your, your successes and your resilience. I'm so impressed with uh, the campus and with the city uh, in the very short period of time and the turnaround that, that, that has happened as we drive through. I also met with Student Federation and these are the student leaders uh, from across the system um, it's kind of interesting, this is the sixth state that I've been in and I will say that this is the most um, cohesive and coherent group of students that I've worked with in a state. Uh, I'd like also to recognize two people, I'd like uh, Ryan Blau, and uh, who's the chair, and Josh Sorbet, the executive director, I'd like them to be recognized, stand up, and please stand up, wave, be recognized. And please raise your hand if you are a member of the Student Federation and you're here. Please give all these students a round of applause as well. You know, I have taught or been with uh, around students for over 40 years in a lot of places. And uh, the collective student leadership in South Dakota is second to none, I can tell you that. Uh, and it bodes well for what South Dakota has for its future. I'd like to recognize the latest addition to my senior staff, uh, Heather Forney, the System Vice President for Finance and Administration. Heather, if you can wait. There you go. Thank you. And I'd also like to recognize the School of Mines and uh, President Rankin, where he welcomed uh, the Undersecretary of Education. I was invited to go on that, and that was very exciting to be a part of and to be in for, uh, you know, an institution uh, in higher education in, in uh, uh, in South Dakota to be recognized nationally. And finally, everyone by now has heard the enrollment reports and the fact that our system numbers are a little bit down, but congratulations to DSU for bucking that trend with an increase in students this fall. So we're happy to be here. Thank you all uh, for your hospitality, and uh, we look forward to the rest of the meeting and getting a lot of good work done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Reports of individual region activities. Any reports by any regions? Reports from individual presidents and superintendent. Any reports there? Student Federation report, Josh. Welcome. 
Thank you. Good to see you all. I distributed the long written version of our report, but I'd like to hit the highlights. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, our host student association, the Dakota Student Senate, um, led by President Nathan Harmer and Vice President Lindsey Vogel. Uh, they've been great at welcoming us to this campus, and it was exciting to go on a tour today, um, as well as host our Student Federation meeting last night in the Trojan Center. Um, the first thing I'd like to hit is our legislative contacts. Um, all of our student associations were assigned uh, representatives and senators to stay in contact with, um, and all of our member schools have contacted at least initially um, representatives and senators at the Capitol. So we have established our legislative contacts to um, engage now so that we have a healthy relationship by the time that legislative session rolls around and, and we can get, have productive conversations with them starting in January. Um, secondly, uh, Dr. Barron talked about this a little bit, but we did have our retreat at the South Dakota Board of Regents office in September, so thank you for welcoming us. It was a great time to connect with the staff. Um, we had a presentation on intellectual diversity in House Bill 1087 um, from Nate Lucas, the general counsel, and that was very informative, and I think it helped the student associations quite a bit um, when figuring out bud budgeting protocols. A uh, few topics of discussion that we had last night, as well as over the past couple months. Um, first, intellectual diversity in the offices of diversity on our campuses. Um, eliciting student feedback is still ongoing for the member institutions. Um, we have held um, education session that we had at the retreat, as well as the individual universities, um, are educating student organizations and the student association senators um, on the law's implementation and enforcement. So um, it is a learning curve, but we are tackling it. We're making sure that all of our policies are um, in line with the new protocol. Um, second, mark your calendars for SHED. We have a confirmed date and time. It will be 7.30 to 11 on February 10th, 2020. Um, and this year to change the location, instead of going off um, the campus in Pier at a convention center will be in the Capitol Rotunda. We thought that going to the legislators would be a lot easier and it'd be a lot easier for us to advance the policy positions that Student Federation will be taking for legislative session um, if we held our event in the Capitol Rotunda. Uh, the long time, uh, three and a half hour time frame for our lobbying event is to accommodate committee schedules for the legislators that Monday morning. Um, just to try to make sure that we get as much contact with legislators as we can. Um, it'll be more of an informal setting. We'll have coffee and donuts and um, hopefully some good conversation. We're hoping to get about 100 students there, um, well-versed in the policies that um, the Student Federation will be taking. Um, if there is an opportunity for any of you all to attend SHED, our students will attend on February 9th, that Sunday. Uh, they'll come and that's when we do our lobbying training as well as um, some networking within the institutions as well as getting to know each other a little bit more. So we would love um, to include you all on the schedule. Um, Dr. Barron will be coming to answer questions and meet the students that Sunday. So if any of the regents are able to, to attend as well, um, we're very open to including that in our schedule. And then lastly, uh, we've had a lot of discussion within Student Federation on the Dakota's Promise Scholarship. Uh, we provided feedback to the staff at our uh, September retreat about the upper limit of the ACT score. Uh, just want to say thank you all for extending that upper limit to 30 plus. It was viewed very favorably among the Student Federation. Um, in general, we're very grateful for the vision of the scholarship. We do think that it'll help our students quite a bit. Um, we don't have an official policy position or anything on the eligibility requirements, but there are a few schools that asked me to um, provi provide some comments at this forum. So at that time, if there are any student associations that would like to um, finish out this report, if you could come up to the front. Welcome. Well, thank you, Josh, and good afternoon, Regent Bastion and members of the board. Um, my name is Carson Zuki, and I'm a first-generation student from Wabe, South Dakota. And uh, my name is Carson Zuki, and I'm a first-generation student um, at the University of South Dakota, and I also serve as student body president. Uh, like Josh said, I just want to provide some comments on the future of the Dakota's Promise Scholarship. First, I commend the proposal to lift the ACT ceiling, which admittedly broadens the reach of this scholarship. Um, and I'd like to strongly encourage the board to consider what it means to have a genuine needs-based scholarship in South Dakota. 
Considering the regional aspect of South Dakota, there could potentially be a large number of students left behind from farm families and small businesses due to the value of non-liquid assets, um, eliminating Pell eligibility. Um, I also encourage consideration regarding the opportunity to allow students to stack all qualifying aid up to the cost of attendance at universities. Um, for now, qualifying grants and scholarships should supersede consideration of federal or private student loans for students who demonstrate financial need. It's important that we maximize the number of students who will be affected by this initiative um, while also balancing the significance of that award. A gap of even one or two thousand dollars could be an influencing decision factor to pursue a secondary education um, and high amounts of student debt could discourage students with limited means from pursuing those opportunities. Additionally, there's a large gap uh, between the minimum 3.0 GPA proposal for the Dakota's Promise and the 2.0 GPA for university enrollment. Success in college is not always a testament of high school performance, especially with regard to GPA. Um, over 50,000 students are reported each academic year to the South Dakota Board of Regents dashboard, um, and that data shows that more than 90% of those students have consistently remained in good academic standing um, over the last five years with the current eligibility requirements for university enrollment. Um, so I just want to thank you all for your time, um, and again, thank you for your diligence in promoting this scholarship. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have for me. Thank you. Good afternoon, Regents. My name is Allie Munson, and I'm currently the president of SDSU Students Association. We want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Yeah, and hello, Regents. My name is Corey Bershite, and I currently serve as the vice president of the SDSU Students Association. Today, Allie and I wanted to share with you a resolution that our Senate passed titled SDSU Students Association Support for the Removal of the Eligibility Ceiling on the Dakota's Promise Need-Based Scholarship Program. After reviewing the requirements for the Dakota's Promise Scholarship, our Senate felt strongly that the board should remove the rec uh, recommendation um, for the eligibility ceiling and then we were higher, uh, really excited um, to see after the agenda came out that that was a change that was made. Um, we believe students uh, with high test scores should not be withheld from receiving funding um, they would otherwise qualify for. Yeah, and our um, resolution also outlines some other criteria that we saw maybe could use some revisions. So our students felt strongly that requirement of the no remedial coursework needed should be struck from the criteria. Um, our Senate felt that the student's success cannot be determined just by an ACT score and how that qualifies them for remedial courses or not. Um, students who could potentially qualify this scholarship may come from backgrounds where they were not granted test prep materials or courses that fully prepared them for college. These students cannot be, should not be penalized because of their background and what was made available to them in their educational experiences. In order to continue the pursuit of making higher education accessible in South Dakota, we believe that striking this requirement is in the best interest of our students. And I do want to emphasize that our Students Association fully supports the eligibility of South Dakota college students attending um, public universities in South Dakota and receiving the Dakota's Promise Scholarship. Um, we support the Board of Regents' continued efforts to establish a needs-based scholarship program. And we want to thank the Board of, Re uh, Board of Regents for their time. Um, and our Senate highly recommends reevaluating the criteria to meet the mission of providing access to higher education. Thank you. Fellow Regents, I'm Nathan Armour. Thank you. I'm Nathan Armour, the uh, Student Senate President of the DSU Student Senate. Um, we do not have an official stance on the eligibility requirements yet. It's something we are still discussing in our Senate. But we overall wanted to, over, just overall wanted to say that um, we're very much behind the Dakota Promise Scholarship. We think it's something that's very much needed, not only on our campus, but in this state. And it's something that's truly going to enable a lot of students in South Dakota to continue their secondary education. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, so just to kind of wrap it up, a Student Federation as a whole on behalf of our six member institutions haven't taken official policy stances or put forth a resolution on Dakota's Promise quite yet. I'd be anticipating that um, probably sometime in December after the University of South Dakota meeting. Uh, we just wanted to hear some of the feedback and some of the questions today that you may have as well as um, we'll be tuning in tomorrow during that portion of the discussion item before we form any sort of um, resolution or anything. But I did want to provide our member institutions a chance to uh, give some feedback that they initially had um, as we continue at the table drafting this going forward. So with that, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, um, we'll stick around. Thank you. And I, I, I would ask that you consider, uh, you're certainly welcome to submit the written remarks uh, to the board so they're included with the minutes. I know that I would, I'd like to have them for reference. Uh, and obviously we listen to all of you, so those without written remarks, uh, thank you for being here. But thank you all. Any questions by anyone? Thank you very much.
Dakota State and Northern State uh, Student Organization Awards, uh, starting with Jim Jacobson, Vice President for Student Affairs, and followed by Chekka Linewall, Associate Vice President for Student Affairs, Dean of Students at Northern. Welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to Dakota State. Thank we you. are happy to have you here. I'm Jim Jacobson, Vice President of Student Affairs, and I'd like to thank the Board of Regents for taking the time today to recognize the accomplishments of three of our student groups. Dakota State University is proud to recognize these student groups today, and we're very proud of their accomplishments. Our first group this, this afternoon is Phi Beta Lambda Business Club. Phi Beta Lambda's purpose is to combine business and education together into a positive relationship using innovative leadership and career development programs. Phi Beta Lambda is represented by David, David Wiedler and Dan Talley. Our second student group this afternoon is the Alliance. The goal of the Alliance is to provide a safe and inclusive environment for people of all identities and to raise awareness of the LGBTQ plus community and its issues. Representing the Alliance today are James Bigger and Marissa Gullery. Our third group to be recognized is CybHer. The purpose of CybHer is to provide a network of support and resources that teach and encourage women to aspire to work in the technology industry. With us this afternoon are Pam Rowland, Ashley Podrosky, Alexis Colm, Abby Witt, Kanthi Nanukanda, and Rianne Lester. As President Griffith shared in her opening remarks, DSU is rising and we are rising due to the quality and the leadership uh, and the caring and the commitment of our students. I'd also like, just like to share briefly that three of the students who received awards today are also student senators. So we have very active students on our campus. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
I'm Chaka Linewall. I'm the Dean of Students at Northern, and I am so excited to share with you three wonderful student organizations, and let me tell you a little bit about their um, successes and introduce the representatives to you. This year, the Award for Academic Excellence on our campus goes to the Honors Program. Every fall, the Honors Program hosts the Northern State University Common Read, the largest academic and widest community reaching event of the year. This past year, they hosted Angie Thompson, author of The Hate You Give and On the Come Up. 1,000 people from the campus and surrounding community attended Thomas's, Thomas's lecture. The Honors Program also sent 10 students to Boston for the National Collegiate Honors Conference in November of 2018. This was the largest number of students accepted to present research at NCHC that Northern has ever had. Of the 10, two students won awards in their division for their outstanding research and presentations. During the awards presentation, only one university nationwide had students who received more than two awards, which put Northern in second place nationally in terms of students placed received at the conference. The Honors Club also assists students academically on campus through uh, tutoring, supplemental instructors, and honors mentors in their living learning community. Today, representing honors, we have James Heisinger and Katie Olson. The Community Service Award goes to our environmental club. The Environmental Club hosts multiple events that qualified them for this award. They collaborated with our art club to build birdhouses from scratch to donate to the NSU community campus and Aberdeen. They, con they conducted three separate roadside cleanup events. In addition, club members have gone to Sand Lake to collect wild seeds for the wildlife rescue, I'm sorry, refuge to disperse on their fields. Another great event was a public showing of the movie A Plastic Ocean, which is a doc documentary to make viewers aware of the hazards of plastics in our environment. The club created and assisted with the recycling program that has been implemented in all buildings on our campus. Lastly, through social media, they share helpful facts on how one can further improve their ecosystem and help the environment. All these activities and events have helped improve the community by physically making it more clean and more beautiful and by raising awareness of how community members can help the environment. Today representing the Environment Club is Jordan Duchesny and Garrett Tostenson. And finally, our Organizational Leadership Award goes to our student newspaper, The Exponent. The Exponent is a bi-weekly newspaper that is written by students and for students. Having been around since 1905, The Exponent has experienced and embraced all the changes that have taken place at Northern, and in turn has progressively grown into a modern newspaper publication that is read on an international scale. By showcasing the work Northern students do, the exponent promotes and supports their academic and extracurricular efforts. They provide coverage on staff and faculty accomplishments that bring international attention to Northern and its community. They keep students aware of the events that are happening or have happened recently on campus, as well as highlight exemplary community leadership. The Exponent has a wide leadership readership base with readers and alumni scattered across the globe, keeping in touch with Northern's goings on. Being a great college news outlet and a community leader on campus is their top priority. Representing our Exponent today is Danielle Knotts and their uh, advisor, Dr. Elizabeth Haller.
And thank you, Regents, for allowing us this opportunity to recognize our students. And thank you again to the students and the advisors. Your contributions and efforts are very important to the campus and the communities. So thank you very much. The consent agenda. Uh, any requests that any item be removed from the consent agenda? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Academic and student affairs. Uh, we'll go about five minutes. At 3.30 we're going to have the diversity panel with the uh, business and industry folks and we'll, we'll uh, break maybe about in about five minutes or so to give them time to come forward and, and get set up. So with that, uh, Regent Wink. Thank you. Um, agenda item 5A1, Board Policy 129, State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement for SARA. Revisions, first reading, Dr. Perry. Thank you, Jay Perry with the Board of Regents Office. In 2014, South Dakota joined the State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement, and essentially what that means is that prior to 2014, if you wanted to offer online programs to anyone out of your state, you had to go through a state-by-state -state authorization process. Every institution had to do it, including paying fees. But in 2014, uh, for regional, accrediting, I'm sorry, not accrediting, for regional higher education compacts uh, like WICHE, MEC, um, started doing this process for institutions in their states and that eventually came under a national SARA organization so that this whole process is much easier and once you go through it once, you don't have to go through it 49 other times to, to offer online education. So that's the backstory, um, but these policy revisions are being brought to you because in 2019, as we were feeling our 20, in 2014, when we started the, our participation, we were all, every state was kind of feeling their way through this and how the, these policies should work. Since then, we've got an awful lot of guidance from National SARA and uh, all of our participants, and they have kind of changed the requirements of what you need in your policy. So what you see here revises that policy that we started in 2014. It's been vetted uh, within our office by myself as well as our general counsel and uh, the person in our office who manages the SARA compact as well as been vetted by the National SARA uh, organization. And the two highlights are we've, we've added uh, uh, significant revisions on the application process for another institution in the state to join SARA and uh, also an appeals process for an institution that is a member of SARA and has some issue with how something has been adjudicated. Uh, and I should point out the Board of Regents is designated by the governor's office as the, what we call the portal entity. entity uh, and so we govern this for all the participating institutions um, in the state, which is not just our institutions, but also uh, private institutes, I believe the technical institutes as well. So, any questions? Any comments, questions? If not, Mr. President, I move to approve the first reading of the proposed revision to Board Policy 129, State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement, or SARA, as presented in Attachment 1. Second. Thank you. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Moving on to agenda item 5A2, Board Policy 223, Accelerated Graduate Program Policy Revisions, first reading. Madam Chair. In April of 2019, we made a policy revision that allowed institutions to create accelerated graduate programs as long as they had 
12 or less hours that counted as both the undergraduate and graduate credits without coming to the board for approval. Um, if there were 13 or more credits, then the board had to approve it. When we made that policy change, we neglected to fix another section of the policy that addresses this same issue, and so we had two conflicting policies. So all, all this is is bringing policy 223 in, a line, in alignment with the revisions the board approved in April in policy 2.5. And if you have more detailed questions about how accelerated graduate programs work, I'm happy to answer them, but uh, this is bringing a policy that's already in place into the correct language in our existing policy manual. Comments or questions? Just a quick question. This appears to be, a, a, like I say, just cleaning up some language. Yes. And so I, I would just ask whether we really need to have a second reading and maybe waive second reading. Mr. Chairman, do you have, have a sense of that? Should we go to second anyone, reading? Rather than have two motions pending, uh, anyone object to making this a second reading? Why don't you go ahead and make your motion then as a second reading? I move, we, uh, we move agenda item 5A2 from first reading to second reading. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. All those same sign. Motion carries. We will be in recess until 3.30. We can. <laughs>
Yeah, it's got a nice bounce to it. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a good feel. Yeah. Welcome to everyone again, and particularly uh, welcome to the folks that are here on our diversity panel, uh, intersection of education and workforce. We have with us uh, this afternoon, uh, David Owen, South Dakota Chamber of Commerce President, Nathan Sanderson, South Dakota Re Retailers Association Executive Director, Carly Gatsky, Dectronics Vice President for Human Resources, Sandra Ogremi, uh, Regional Health Manager, Diversity, Inclusion, and Equality, and Nicole Friesman of Raven, Vice President of Human Re Resources. Uh, I'd like to start from my right uh, with Ms. Friesman and have each of you just give a brief uh, opening statement, uh, for lack of a better description, uh, a little bit about who you are, what you do, and the importance of these issues in the workplace and how they relate to what we do. Uh, and then we'll open it up to, for questions and uh, hopefully have a good dialogue. This is intended to be a rather informal gathering. So. With that, please proceed. All right, good afternoon. My name is Nicole Friesman. I am the Vice President of Human Resources with Raven Industries. I've been with Raven now a little over 11 years in various HR roles uh, and, and today lead our HR function. Uh, as I was asked to be here, um, as far as considering my opening statement, uh, I was to make comment about diversity and cultural education as an important conversation in South Dakota. And so I'm going to speak a little bit from uh, our, our perspective at Raven. Um, but it, diversity and inclusion is a hot topic for employers today. And often uh, companies uh, mistakenly assume diversity and inclusion are synonymous, but they are not. Uh, there are many dimensions of diversity which include the visitable traits such as age, gender, disability, and ethnic background. But there's also invisible ones too, such as so, uh, socioeconomic status, marital status, education background, uh, and sexual orientation. And of course, inclusion refers to a culture and environment of feeling of belonging. Uh, and, that is, and that is what we support at Raven. Uh, in the past, most employers have been compliance uh, focused as it relates to diversity, such as EEOC policies. But today, employers are focused on inclusion. Um, companies, including Raven, are becoming global at a faster rate. And in order for us to get the most out of our people resources, we have to respect our differences and ensure a sense of comfort and belonging within our workforce. So as I mentioned, Raven is committed to treating one another with dignity and respect uh, and maintaining employment practices based upon equal opportunity. And that is something that has been um, a part of our company for a significant period of time. And respect is really where inclusion lies for us. Uh, we haven't thought about diversity and inclusion until most recently because our culture is founded on respect. And when you respect one another, you typically uh, have inclusion. But when we think about Raven, we think about ourselves as a Raven family which means that we are accepting of each other's differences. Uh, and we build those into our hiring practices and our training practices and our development practices. But as we look at how um, the school systems can help us with that educational piece, we know that, uh, that our society is becoming multi, uh, multicultural uh, and it is best served by a culturally responsive curriculum. Um, schools that acknowledge that diversity of their student population understand the importance of promoting cultural awareness. Having students that are culturally aware only makes it easier for employers in creating an environment of respect. Uh, and it is schools that have the ability to touch a population when they are probably most moldable, uh, and that is in the stage of learning. That is my opening comment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Owen? People that can, people that can be, be, be that brief scare people like me that are lobbyists. Uh, <laughs> Dave, David Owen, South Dakota Chamber of Commerce and, and Industry, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I have to mention as an aside, I've rarely been given the treat of a reserved parking spot with my name on it. 
uh, which made me feel real important. Then the zero sum part of my personality kicked in, and I figured that's taxable income. Oh. <laughs> So, somehow. Um, I'm um, over 60. I'm um, pasty white. I'm pudgy. I'm male. When it comes to diversity, I'm the personification of the problem. Um, and so to address the answer is a, is a treat. The chamber um, is a collection of uh, probably the most diverse collection of businesses um, the gentleman on my right runs the largest business association in the state, and they are retailers, and there are hospital associations and others. Around the board table for the South Dakota Chamber sits the health systems, sits the large financial institutions, sits a significant representation of the manufacturers here, so we're diverse, and uh, we're fairly um, large, uh, large employers. I want to spend about two minutes uh, because I, I lose control of my brain and it wanders um, as a uh, former labor secretary knows. Um, I looked up the word diversity and I, and I found out it was first used in the 14th century. And one of the most interesting reads I've done in the last 20 years talked about the turn of the, cent the millennium to the year 1000. And it said the first thing you would notice is how quiet it was. But everybody lived in villages of about 280 people and rarely went more than 20 miles from home. So this idea of accommodating things that are different, which I think is the challenge before us when we talk about diversity, has been going on for 800 years. And I always say tongue in cheek, my members like change, as long as nothing's different. <laughs> Here's a glimpse of the South Dakota census in 1920. 98% white, 2% Native American, 0.1% black African American, or as it was phrased at the time, Negro. In 2000, the last census, we were 84% white, 9% Native American, 4% Hispanic, 2% black or African American. South Dakota's changing, and that's the reality. The number one problem that we talk about around my board table, unless I'm forcing a discussion about hemp, <laughs> is finding workers and legal immigration is going to be part of that answer. People that are diverse in their lifestyles is going to be part of that answer, and is today, and is really important. We're doing things that I, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have thought of. We brought a bill with the Rapid City Chamber and the Sioux Falls Chambers and 12 other groups to try to get South Dakota to offer driver's license manuals and examinations in Spanish because we want those people to be safe on the road while they get to work. And if you're waiting for public transportation in Rapid City, you're gonna die sitting on a corner because they don't have any. So this becomes important to our membership as an expression uh, of diversity. Smithfield Food CEO was in town yesterday. Had the privilege of talking with him. And they went back to try to figure out, you know, it's legendary how many languages are spoken in Morrell's plant. They figure it's more than 40, someplace around 50. Then we get to the, the, my concluding comments. There's another form of diversity um, that you all are dealing with that's it, tougher yet. Um, and that is the expressions, the utterances, the language, the philosophies that get expressed on campus. What's tolerable, what's not. It is essential that people be confronted with the whole range of diversity of thought because that's how they're gonna learn critical thinking. That's how they're gonna become 
thoughtful CEOs. That's how they're going to become thoughtful shift supervisors. And we will do everything we can to promote critical thinking, putting things in context. There's three areas that the South Dakota Chamber was involved with during the last session that separate us from our traditional political conservative folks, and that's legal immigration, including the driver's license issue, transgender and lifestyle kinds of issues, and making sure we don't pass laws that blindly discriminate against them, and getting kids that are at risk into early education so they can be productive citizens and keep poverty and incarceration to a minimum. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. David. Uh, my name is Nathan Sanderson. I'm the executive director of the South Dakota Retailers Association. Uh, South Dakota Retailers Association represents almost 4,000 businesses in 160 different business categories. That's everything from your car wash to your local gas station to your grocery stores, restaurants, hotels, and everything in between. Uh, we do primarily three things, advocacy, information, and we provide services for our members. Um, I don't, we don't survey our members, uh, those almost 4,000 members, on diversity with any real uh, regularity. It doesn't really happen. But if you, you ask me to say, well, the, of the members that uh, you have, who owns those businesses? Well, generally speaking, the primary operator is a man. Generally speaking, in South Dakota, he is white. And generally speaking, he's probably over 50. Now, it's interesting when you talk diversity because the staff of the South Dakota Retailers Association includes 11 individuals, including one male. So I have a staff of 10 women, 11 uh, total uh, uh, individuals on the staff that serves a series of member businesses that are very likely predominantly white males. It's an interesting dichotomy, and um, I don't know what that means, but it probably means something. You know, when it comes to uh, the definition of diversity for retail businesses, uh, there's an old joke that says that uh, business owners are almost colorblind. The only color they can see is green. And I think that's probably right when it comes to this conversation about diversity. What do retail businesses value? Well, they value intellectual diversity and they value diversity of perspective. Intellectual diversity and diversity of perspective. I, th I think that's primarily the lens through which our retail businesses value diversity. Um, last thing that I'll say before we move on, this, is, this conversation today is the intersection of politics and policy. And it's interesting uh, to navigate that because there's all sorts of things that swirl around that. You know, in today's society, we view everything through a political lens. Studies have shown we're more political, uh, more polarized than we have ever been. Um, with that context, it's hard for you all to decide how do we navigate this in a changing environment? How do the folks that are sitting at the table behind me, those university presidents, navigate that? But one thing I think is certain, uh, Mr. Owen mentioned it, communication and the way that we communicate is so critical to this process, and I look forward to being part of the dialogue this afternoon. Thank you. Ms. Gatsky. My name is Carla Gatsky. I'm responsible for HR at Dactronics. Dactronics is a South Dakota-founded organization, and we're now about 2,500 people. But only about 1,500 are in South Dakota. The other 1,000 are across the country and worldwide. And our customers are also across the country, across our country, plus in 70-plus other countries. And so our employees are engaging in a multicultural environment on a daily basis. Like Nicole said at Dactronics as at Raven, we haven't really talked about diversity and inclusion the way that we're talking about it today. We were based on the values of helpful, honest, and humble. And that's what we teach. And that's the behaviors that we expect of employees. Supporting then a respectful and trustful environment. And that's now how we describe inclusion, to behave in a way that's uh, creating this environment that's respectful and trustful so that we can be successful as a business. So our teams, our, 
high performing and our individuals are contributing at their max. Some ways that we've talked about diversity historically is diversity of perspectives and diversity of experiences to bring those multiple perspectives because a diversity of perspectives enables us to have uh, more likely possibilities of understanding what our customers might value and how we might serve those. And so how do we pull onto the team this diversity of perspectives? We need people with different experiences. And that feeds now our conversation about diversity in the traditional senses as well, in the diversity in gender and in nationality and in sexual preferences, gender preferences, and so on. So diversity of experiences and diversity of perspectives is important to us. And then now how we also talk about inclusion is how do we leverage that diversity through our behaviors of curiosity and our behaviors of um, wondering and questioning. That serves in sol problem solving as well. But if I'm curious about you as a person, I'm more likely to understand what matters to you and be able to have a trustful and respectful conversation so we can more likely pull the best out of both of us to solve this problem. That's what we talk about there. How do, how do you all help us help our employees be successful? How do you help us teach our future employees how to do that? We're this global company now, but when I looked, 80% of our employees who have a bachelor's degree got their bachelor's degree in South Dakota. So how are we teaching in our current and future employees this curiosity, this respect for diverse perspectives and experiences? We employers, we rely on you all to provide that capability to us. So what we see you doing we believe is really, really critical to providing us these employees who have this curious mindset and who will be able to pull from each other and from the team the best performance by being respectful and creating this environment of trust. Thank you. Ms. Ogaremi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sandra Ogunremi with Regional Health. I oversee diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm going to go uh, over some of the questions that you had asked us. And how do, how do we at Regional Health define diversity and cultural awareness? Diversity, um, Werner Meyer said, diversity is inviting everyone to the party, and inclusion is asking them to dance. So, so many times, we don't even stop to think, are we being diverse? Have we invited everyone? And everyone means anyone within our community who wants to apply for a job, they are welcome. They may be veterans, they may be people with some form of disability, we make reasonable accommodation, they may be older citizens in our community, they may be male, they may be female, um, they might be of a different race, ethnicity, language, or, or uh, national origin. Everyone is welcome. We're not going to stop to check your political views, we're not going to stop to check your religious affiliations or your sexual orientation or preferences. Anyone and everyone in our community, they are welcome to come and work with us as long as they adhere to our purpose, our mission, our visions, and our values. And so that is diversity. But we focus a lot on inclusion because sometimes we have the numbers right. But you're not including, you're not asking people to dance. At Regional Health, we ask anyone and everyone to dance. They then have the option to say, I don't feel like dancing today. And that is OK, too. And what is cultural awareness? We actually use cultural awareness in one of the classes that I teach. And cultural awareness, really, the definition can be um, taking a step back from yourself and becoming aware of your own values, your perceptions, your belief system, and then understanding yourself enough that you can then go out and help someone else. If you don't understand your own values, your beliefs, your perception, you cannot fully understand somebody else because you're going to use your own frame of reference to define how they do things. For example, not everyone in our Lakota community, especially the traditional elders, will make direct eye contact. 
And so if I were a Lakota presenting, speaking to you today, I might be looking down if I'm traditional. Well, one culture says that is lack of confidence. Another culture says that is respectful. Now, because I work a lot with Native Americans, I have I formed the habit of introducing myself as Sandra Ogunremi. Typically, if I was in a setting that included physicians, I would have to tell myself, remember to say, you're Dr. Sandra Ogunremi. You're dealing with medical doctors. But the Lakota community is a humble community. You do not go into that community giving them your accolades and how many years you've done stuff. So cultural awareness is understanding the differences between how you would normally behave, how the culture you're going to go into will behave, and, 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 and closing that gap. And that is something that we do at Regional Health. Why is this important? Because we deal with patients. How do you assess a behavioral health patient who is not responding immediately to you? In one culture, if I ask you what's your pain level, you say five and you move on, it's a quick response. Another culture says you pause. And if you're pausing, does that mean you're not fully coherent? That doesn't mean that. So understanding one culture won't make direct eye contact, one culture might pause, another culture might have a gentle shake versus a firm handshake. And so using that to understand when you're, when you're caring for a patient, you cannot use one set of standards to, to make dis decisions. And, and so we are very aware of that. Um, another question that was asked is, do you expect uh, does your organization demonstrate diversity and cultural awareness competency? Absolutely. I've given the example of the patients we deal with. We on occasion might have patients that are students. We might have patients from different communities who come in after injured after a, after a sports game. We, we take into consideration the different cultures. Um, Ramadan season will come soon and we have to understand that potentially Muslim caregivers might be fasting and if they're fasting, that is not the month to have potlucks endlessly around our healing environments. And, and, and so we take that into consideration. We take into consideration the, the menus that we serve. We have um, caregivers who do not eat beef because it's just not acceptable in their religion. We have caregivers who do not eat pork and caregivers who do not eat different things. And we have the vegetarians. We have to think of all of our caregivers, all of our patients, ensure that we meet their needs. And we have to ensure that for, for the care of the patients, it is always culturally appropriate. You've got patients who do not, under any circumstance, want a blood transfusion. We will not violate that. Uh, based on their religious beliefs. And so understanding and demonstrating cultural competency is actually a requirement um, within the regulations for healthcare. We must have cultural competency. Um, how does cultural awareness and diversity training advance your company in terms of productivity, ability to, uh, to have productive interchange? It does a great job. Because now we kind of, through years, we've done this for years, um, we've measured it. We have people understanding each other, understanding that um, if you use the Lewis model, someone who just comes maybe from an area that is multi-reactive might laugh and giggle a little bit more than someone who comes from a reactive environment or from a linear environment. And so um, we cannot measure engagement of any caregiver or of our patients based on how we would like to see things. We do a lot of education. We have a monthly cultural diversity gathering. We listen to different perspectives. We cover all the different topics. Our caregivers embrace it. Cultural awareness trainings, we typically get a perfect five anonymous score because people want to learn. And one of the things that helps people learn a lot is we're not pushing our personal view, views. We're saying, understand the people you're working with. Outside of my day job, I'm an Assemblies of God ordained minister. And so when I say that in gatherings like this, people are like, and you do this work absolutely every single day. My job is to make sure that when anyone comes into our healing environments, they are welcome, they know they will be cared for, and all of our caregivers were all swimming in the same direction, physicians, non-physicians, regardless of any other things that we have talked about. Cultural training and awareness is so important. It is important that we embrace it. I get a little bit shocked when I watch the news and people are pounding their fists and fighting over things. I say, hey, like, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, sir, but you had said you're, you're, the, you're not the poster child because you are above 60 and tall, white male. You are the ones I need because the majority can speak for the minorities. And so I embrace and love when we can work together and I can have someone who can champion this cause. And we have cultural champions across my organization, think of any category, they're all covered. Um, we value it, we model it, we live it, we're proud of it. 
Um, and, and so, I, you know, as we have this conversation and as it's opened up for discussions for other people, I want to say we have so much internal change and external change. We've partnered with our community. We're part of Rapid City Community Conversations. There is trust. Our healing rooms are used in the evenings by our community members who used to be afraid five, six years ago that are their patients safe? Are their family members safe? Guess what? Open the meeting rooms in the evenings. Let them come in, use it, learn, and feel welcome in our healing environments. We've turned the way things are done. And so it is possible to have these difficult conversations in a non-threatening manner. And so I look forward to the future. If you ever need me for anything, on behalf of Regional Health, I'm here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions from the board? I've got a question to start us off with, I guess, and maybe primarily it's directed at some of the HR folks uh, on the panel, but um, how often when you're interviewing potential hires do questions surrounding diversity, inclusion, that sort of thing come up? And if so, what might be some examples of those questions? How are they phrased? And what sort of responses might you be looking for from those, um, those candidates? Uh, so I will answer for us. We do not ask questions around diversity and inclusion, but instead we interview for a cultural fit. And that cultural fit is based upon uh, shared values, which include drive, courage, humility, authenticity, and integrity. We feel like those shared values create an environment uh, of inclusiveness, which is really what we get to. And through that, we will find diverse candidates that have those shared values um, with us. But, um, but we do not ask specific questions around diversity uh, and a competency around that. You almost have to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> I might just dive in really quick. Um, I would say that would be typical for a retail business as well. You know, when they're, when they're interviewing individuals, that would not be a standard line of questioning. It's more like, how do they fit within the culture? And how do they demonstrate their cultural awareness, their uh, own individual diversity of perspective during the course of the interview process? It's more, it, it's less overt in most cases. Thank you. We have one more HR person. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm curious about, were you, were you imagining us as the employer asking a candidate something, and what kinds of? I was just curious if topics surrounding diversity ever come up in, in any interview processes. If, if, that, if that's ever, I mean, you're talking about Try, seeking candidates who are, you know, certainly a fit within the organizational culture, but is diversity addressed in any, as we're, as we're, as we're discussing it today, is that mm -hmm. any sort of component at all? Just wondering. Yeah, that is interesting. As was mentioned, we as the employer, we don't ask specifically those, what's your take on diversity or are you, um, and we also don't hear often we do try to give the candidates uh, as much as possible a picture of what it would be like at Dactronics. And so frankly, actually, your question has prompted me to consider how do we discern um, uh, what our environment feels like to a candidate who really does have an interest in diverse, a diverse workplace. And we may not be the best judges of that because we're so familiar with it. So it does give me a... Um, a takeaway, which I appreciate, of how can we get, maybe get a better perspective of what our environment feels like to a person who has that real interest. Sure. Thank you. I, I want to add something to that. In my organization, just as in every organization, we're not supposed to ask certain questions, which we don't. But there are other questions that we could ask, which we do. For instance, if we are recruiting and um, if we're interviewing a, a physician that is where we have a shortage, and the physician looks very different with a name that is very different. And we know they might have that question at the back of their minds, will they be accepted? Will they be welcome? That's a question we have to help them answer. And so we will always ask, 
do you have any concerns? Are there anything, do you have anything that you want us to help you answer today? And usually I meet with all of our visiting uh, physicians, re potential recruits, and the question always comes up because we've created that culture where they say, will I be welcome? Will I be welcome? My last name indicates I, I, I might not be, I, I'm, I might have a different national origin, I might have a different religious perspective, will I be welcome? And typically, we'll immediately connect them with somebody else who is affiliated with their region of the world, where they come from, their national origin, who then ensure that they know that they are welcome, they will be treated very well. And so we've gone that extra step to not just have a safe space, but a brave space. Okay, thanks. One thing that I would maybe add, uh, so you asked the question about do we interview for that, but I think if you take a step back from the interview process and you look at true recruitment, uh, I think all of us as employers today would say that we are aiming for a diverse workforce, uh, knowing that there is a talent shortage. We want to ensure that we pull on different demographics, whether that is age, gender, race, disability, and so on. And so through our recruitment practices, we try to uh, target different audiences other than just a particular audience. So I don't know if that helps a little bit, but it's, it's not in the interview process. It's a step back from the interview sure. process. Certainly, thank you. Let me ask the same question in maybe just a little different way. And how do you, how do you ensure that employees have cultural awareness? I mean, is it part of an employment contract that you uh, treat everyone in, in the business uh, fairly and equally and with respect? Is it, is it just simply expected that they perform that way? Uh, is there ongoing teaching, seminars and things, required, uh, required classes, if you will, that employees have to go to to, uh, to learn about these things? I'm just wondering how you, uh, you certainly have it in your businesses. I'm just wondering how you ensure that you have it, and, and if someone is is outside of those norms, how how they are dealt with. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, of course, it depends on the business, and certainly, um, well, for instance. South Dakota Retailers Association has a number of tourist-based businesses. South Dakota uh, relies heavily on tourism after agriculture as our number two business. And so you can think of a number of tourist-based businesses, especially in western South Dakota, that uh, deal with a very broad, diverse clientele. Uh, we have uh, a number of employers who utilize H-2B or J-1 visas. And so part of the onboarding process for employees includes some uh, manner of cultural awareness. It's going to uh, vary greatly depending on the number of employees that you have. If you're a smaller shop, you're going to largely cover that through the hiring process and through one-on-one -on -one communications. If you're a larger organization, it's going to be more built into your culture. It might be trainings, seminars, those kinds of things. You might even have that as part of your onboarding process uh, as, as a new employee comes on board. And so different businesses are going to apply all of those and more. I think the, the take home message is cultural awareness is an important thing. I, I can't speak firsthand to the employment experience. Um, I've got two other people that work for me um, and I assume they're looking for jobs every day. Um, but, but I'll tell you a place where we're just learning to do this is in that legislative process, which invites a wide range of dialogue and ideas, some of which are just putrid. And when we see, and we're getting better, but we have a long way to go. When we see Senator Neil Tapio, and I'll name names, bringing an anti-immigration screed into a committee, we let the immigration community react, but there was a number of the business community that were in that line telling that senator, this has to stop. We don't accept this. That's not funny. Like I said, we're getting better at that, but the, the environment will change when the folks that have created the environment guide the change. 
Mr. Chairman? I would like to hear from each of you. Um, I wanted to say at Regional Health, all of our caregivers, all of our physicians, all of our leadership, everyone has gone through cultural awareness training. It is part of our onboarding. We do it at day one, and then we do a follow-up at day 90 to follow up on the discussions, and then we encourage our caregivers to continue attending the classes that we have provided all year long. We, re we record so that people can get, get um, continued education credits, but also to ensure that if someone for some reason, health reasons, missed a class, we could get them into the class that they need to be in. So it is something that we ensure that it's face-to-face, -face, it's not online. Thank you. Thank you, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, Nate, you talked to us about navigating the delicate little line between policy and politics. But in our work, we, as you know, in our state, we are navigating right now, and many of the faculty and many of the staff and all of the presidents are navigating that very delicate balance between pedagogy, teaching and learning, and politics. I mean, it's a difficult time, for, particularly for some staff and faculty and presidents, and we're trying to do our best at that. My question from each of you, how would you advise us? Because you know our state, you know what we're living. What would you tell us? My mother uh, had a couple of uh, individual statements that she would make from time to time, and a few of them actually stuck. Uh, one of the ones that has stuck for me is, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. How is that applicable here? I don't know that there are very many people who are going to say, diversity is not important. I don't think there are very many people who are going to say, cultural awareness is not important. I don't think you're going to hear that a whole lot. But it's how you go about the process. And so it's not what you do or not what your goals are, it's how you try and achieve them, right? And so for your particular cases, you're in sort of the similar situation as uh, I am when I talk about retail businesses. You've got some diversity offices that are very large, much more bureaucratic. You've got others that are a little bit smaller and a little more nimble. It varies from institution to institution. And so how you're going to navigate that space is honestly going to have to be institution to institution. But I'll come back to something I mentioned in the opening comments. It's all about communication. So critical. And because we view, uh, we, I mean the collective we, I mean you, me, politicians, I mean citizens at large, I mean the media, everybody, because we have come to view things through such a political lens, we've got to infuse that in our thinking and our communications. I'm not saying you have to be political, I'm not saying that, but you have to think politically in your communications. And I mean, Hey, I've got a PhD too. I spent a lot of years in, in schools. I've seen a lot of this stuff. Pedagogy doesn't follow politics. It's slow on the uptake. It always is. It's going to continue to be. Or, That's just, or maybe it leads. Or <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's part and parcel to, the, to the, the beast, if you will. And so I think my uh, piece of advice would be, as we're thinking about how we communicate these things, you've got to have that somewhere in the back of our mind. Again, it's not what the goal is, it's how we achieve the goal. So I'd like to ask a question. Um, I would agree. I, I, I kind of see it as a, as a three-legged stool of politics, policy, and education. And so I would like to ask you all, what do you expect from prospective employee from pers from the prospective employees um, that you talk to? What do you expect that they have learned from their education in diversity, inclusion, and cultural awareness? What do you What do you think they should have um, gained from their educational experience uh, in whatever baccalaureate degree or graduate degree they may have received? What do you think they should bring with them that makes them valuable to the workplace? as it relates to uh, diversity, inclusion, and cultural awareness. If I can jump ahead and maybe go back and answer the, the previous question as well. Um, kicking the board of regents around during a legislative session is just some people's idea of their favorite indoor sport. Um, <laughs> You know, and watching it can be amusing as well. Um, <laughs> I, 
I think we're in this uh, period right now with this focus and, and whether you're too liberal or too conservative. And, and unfortunately, our political dialogue is now being driven um, by polling. I run campaigns. I run statewide ballot measure campaigns. I do that kind of political research. I'm responsible for that kind of spin because it moves votes. However, the first casualty of war is truth, and my dad taught me there's nothing more stubborn than a fact. I will tell you there will ultimately be great powers in taking all of the anecdotal stories, half of which are just crap, and just quietly telling the truth, asking advocates like us to join you in telling that truth so that we can have people at coffee clashes and dinner it's kind of saying, did you hear about this? Saying, that's not true. And that's a first gear, long hill, slow climb, and there's nothing exciting about it. But I am old fashioned enough to think that when you get the truth out about those stories and we can calm some of the rhetoric and some of the sound bites and some of the stuff that gets created out of that spin and, and research, because that's not going away. Um, that, that's one of your best uh, answers. And so um, that's the question. <laughs> Excellent question following. I'll let somebody else in. Uh, I will answer the question more directly as far as what do we hope that policy, politics, and education bring together, uh, and what do we expect that our students have learned coming into the workforce? So more than anything, we hope that students have learned uh, how to remove barriers without putting up new barriers when it comes to diversity. Uh, we want them to come into a workforce open-minded uh, and curious, as Carla uh, had alluded to, but um, also having the ability to collaborate uh, with one another through knowing that there is diverse experience and perspective and thought and coming to a common ground in which we can solve problems. I'd like to add, um, you know, we want young graduates, old graduate, graduates, older graduates, depending, we want everyone to know that they are welcome. We want them to come embracing others. When they join the workforce, embrace others. They don't have to think like you. They don't have to be you. I tell our new caregivers, if we were all, and there are some exercises we do, and then we, we all go into different corners based on those activities, and we do so many different ones, and they're all separated out, all of us at some point will disagree with each other if we keep on asking questions. When we take care of patients, we want everyone to focus on the purpose with which they're there. So we encourage and hope our new graduates will come in, focus positive energy on why they're there and embrace one another. That's what we hope they bring. Now these, these were well articulated positions and I agree with most of them. We've, we've shared here how we're striving in our workplaces to create a welcoming environment, to create high performing teams that have diverse perspectives, to be able to communicate in a way that pulls the best from each of us towards the problem. We would want the students that come from our universities to have abilities to do that best if they've had opportunities to practice that in their curriculum and in their extracurricular activities. And in addition, then we'll grow and, and build on those capabilities. Uh, two, two things. Um, one of the greatest gifts ever given to me was a political affairs director of the Montana Power Company who early in my career said, always allow the possibility that your opponent is right or at least has a point and think through those arguments. And my second thing that I've learned being a crusty old guy now, um, geez, we don't put things in context enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I go back 20 years. Greg Dean, who is one of my favorite people on this planet, 
worked for me when I first took this job over 20 years ago. And he kept running into my office with all these facts and statistics about how internet sales was growing and it doubled last year and it's gonna double this year and it's gonna double every year in the foreseeable future. And I kept looking at him going, what percent of sales is it now? Took him two weeks to find out, but he comes in and he goes less than one. Said, okay, that's different. But if we can put all these headlines in context and see how they're interrelated and you can teach people to critically think that way, that's the key to getting more right. I would just add, I couldn't agree more on the context thing. Context is so, so, so important. And that comes back to my message related to communication earlier. I mean, you have to put this in a little bit different context than you would otherwise think that you would need to when communicating with lawmakers and the public. Lawmakers and the public are not academics. Trust me, I know, I'm sort of like a recovering academic. Sorry, guys. I mean, this is, this is the kind of thinking that you have to have in the back of your mind. How is this going to be viewed by those who are in position to make life difficult for you? Got to be part of your thinking. So as I've been sitting here, <laughs> I'm wondering if I maybe could have rephrased my first question a little bit better. I wonder if that was a little bit misinterpreted initially. I think we've since kind of <laughs> gotten to the point of what I was looking for, and that was really how, how do you get a sense of a, per, of a person's understanding of and appreciation for diversity as it relates to the workforce? And I, since I think we've kind of gotten to that more, but I want to make sure I wasn't, I don't know, misinterpreted initially. Just making sure. Sorry about that. Any questions from the students that we have in the audience? Or anybody else in the audience, for that matter? Or anyone? Sure, why don't you? Yeah. Come on up, please. Thank you, Paul. Sure, that'd be great. Can you pr press, your, press the button there? Okay. Hello, my name is Carl Peterson. I'm a student here at Dakota State University. Um, my question is kind of looking at all this in context, as we've mentioned, um, do the people here on the panel from our various, um, you know, job and businesses across the uh, state, when looking at this, once you get that feel for what um, type of feeling um, you know, a potential employee might have for diversity, how do you decide if the, the feeling that they've given towards your culture uh, in your business is conductive to that culture? Let's say you feel that that student comes to you and, and as a potential employee um, makes you feel, as the people on the hiring committee, that one of their core values is hatred of others and that that is what they want to bring into your environment. Do you allow that? How can you tell if that's something that might become a problem? And if you discover it after they're hired, what do you do when, when hatred that may have been fostered at an institution like this one or other Board of Regents schools um, comes into your workplace? How is that addressed? Again, Nathan Sanders and retailers, far be it for me to speak for our, all of our businesses, but I'll say for myself, I traditionally am leery of anyone who comes to anything with a set agenda. Whether that's wanting to be on a board or commission, whether that's wanting to be hired in a workplace, whether that's wanting to be part of a group or committee or what have you, uh, people who come with an agenda tend to only want to be interested in that agenda. And so, you know, what are the repercussions of, of uh, hiring somebody who has this uh, mentality or mindset? Well, obviously, if it's, it's antithetical to your cultural, culture as an organization or as a business, you're going to take steps to either correct the problem or you're going to get rid of them. I mean, it's, it's really that simple. If they don't fit your culture, then they don't belong within your organization. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other comments by anyone? Any other questions? Oh, please. I'm sorry, there was a question earlier about uh, employee behaviors, and I feel like that relates to this. So um, in our organization, and I suspect many, there are expected behaviors usually based on things um, like engendering respect and engendering trust and a team that will work together. There are behaviors that are expected, and it's to the behaviors that we teach and that we uh, are explicit about the expectation and that we make corrections if needed. And so the, the mindset likely matters, but it's to the behaviors that we're really focused on. I'll also add, um, in addition to the behaviors and correcting the behaviors, a question I often ask is, where did that come from? Because sometimes a person might act in what we would deem a hateful behavior manner, but they're not being hateful. They just don't know differently. That might be shocking. In some cultures of the world, it is OK to say, hey, and I can pick on you because you're very slim and beautiful. They can say, you're fat, and they're not being offensive. Another culture says you do not talk about a woman's weight, ever, under any circumstance. So. Yes, the men are saying yes. If you want to live and go home, you do not talk about the woman's weight. And so one culture says it's bad. Another culture, I witnessed a lady once who did not know about 15 years ago who was singing a song and ended it with a word that she should not have ended the song with. And I pulled her aside and I said, you can't say that. She did not know. And so there, is people, there are people with agendas, and if they come in with an agenda, you have to figure that out and deal with that, try to correct the behavior or the exit, but there's also a lot of people who have lived in communities that are very small and don't know that certain things are wrong. They need an opportunity for an education, they need an opportunity for help, and they need to grow and expand their knowledge base and not be punished for their lack of knowledge. They usually make some of our best advocates. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. I have a question. Go ahead, Jim. What happens when you uh, have hired employees, if you're good, to come in, but now you have uh, two employees because of culture are, are clashing? You come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different races or whatever, and there's infighting. How do you address to solve that issue? We always get to the root cause. We listen. Listening is so important. Understanding why you said what you said that caused her to be upset and what she said, and trying to say it in a different way. Oftentimes, we say, say it in a different way. Someone who has English as their second language may not know, may, in a moment of frustration, not be able to articulate their words correctly, and might, say, might not say, Could, would you consider letting me speak at this point? You might hear someone say, shut up. But they don't mean shut up the way we mean shut up. That's a point where you start to educate. And we've told all, we tell all our caregivers, day one, if someone says something that is offensive to you, tell them to say it in a different way. Let them say it again and again until you can get to the root cause. We have seen, we have seen a significant decrease in misunderstandings based on culture. Do we still have it every now and then? Absolutely. And then we have to educate. You can't pound your fist if your culture permits that to make your point. One culture says pounding your fist is making your point. Another culture says that's potential assault. You're getting too close to, into my face. Some cultures don't have that bubble. Some cultures have, this is my personal space. So we work through it. And till date, we have been able to help people see things through a different lens. We don't have it as much anymore, because people have learned to talk through their differences. Other comments on that question? I would just reiterate uh, what was said, that uh, as employers, we seek to understand the differences first and educate. Um, but we also come back to what are our cultural expectations um, that we have set in the organization and, and make those very clear to the team members that we employ that in certain cases, we do not have tolerance uh, um, uh, for certain behaviors, no matter uh, 
how much there might be a misunderstanding or a lack of education. There are just certain ground rules that we have to have as an employers. Um, but of course, seeking to understand differences first is, is where we go as employers. Go ahead. Um, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Ryan Blau, I'm a student at the South Dakota School of Mines. And uh, I'm going to the School of Mines to eventually get a job. My education is for my employment. So what can we do as students and as student leaders to foster a future pattern of inclusive behavior at the collegiate level to ensure success in the workplace later on? Um, thanks for asking the question. And, and here's pr probably the answer you could get from your folks. And so it's <laughs> dis dismissible right off the bat. <laughs> I become proud of you for being in the mine. I wasn't smart enough to even, I lived in Rapid City and I drove away from the mines because I couldn't, I wasn't going there. Um, your statement that says I'm going to the mines to get my job. I would begin with reshaping that and having you push some liberal arts conversations and looking at this time in your life is not just job preparation but preparation to be a citizen in whatever community you're gonna be. Looking at this god-awful mess that we call politics, or looking for chances to express a faith, looking for nonprofits, rounding yourself out as a true human being will make you more valuable in the workplace. I'll add this, um, and it's, it's more of a, a personal statement than it is a professional one. I found that when it comes to that well-roundedness, that diversity, it was more the experience of being at an institution of higher learning that was the key driver than any specific diversity-related class or initiative or project or anything like that. It was the experience of interacting with people from different backgrounds and cultures and ethnicities and everything that that, that deals with. That was the driver. It was the experience and the process not necessarily like any one specific thing, class, initiative, what have you. Irrigate your life with diversity and you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thanks very much. Yeah. Well, I, I happened to be this morning on the campus of SDSU at the Engineering College Advisory Group. They have an industry group that meets periodically. And what the industry folks were actually sharing with the uh, college was how do, we, how do we help you help your students develop critical thinking and ability to work with others and uh, collaborative team-oriented behaviors. That was a pretty strong statement from the industries there of what they're looking for in future, in this case, in future engineers. So my thinking was, how do we create those ex opportunities for experiences for students while on campus? How do we form teams in the class when we have a team project? How do we choose the extracurricular activities that we're in? How do we? invite others to join us in homework groups and so on. Seems like some of those things could also enable what the industry was asking for in terms of being able to work together as teams regardless of the experiences and backgrounds and perspectives. Is that the kind of area you were exploring? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you all very much, it was very beneficial. Good afternoon. My name is Carson Zupke. I'm a student at the University of South Dakota. I first want to thank you all for participating in this uh, discussion today, and thank you for the Regents for hosting this conversation. Um, I couldn't agree more. These conversations are very critical to how we choose, how we approach all these situations in the future. Um, we've heard a lot about what your organizations value um, from employees you're looking to hire in the future. I'm curious to hear what you have to say from an employer perspective of uh, maybe a level of preparedness you've noticed from the universities for new employees coming to organizations and if there's been any trend um, in those, that level of preparedness. Can 
could, could you amplify that a little bit? Could you, could you just expand on what, on the nature of your question, please? Sure. Um, I guess from my perspective, I've noticed that uh, diversity efforts have gained um, a lot of conversation lately, um, referencing the last maybe 10, 15 years as far as employment. Um, so I'm curious maybe if you've noticed um, increasing levels of awareness um, for other cultures from your employees um, in recent history versus um, maybe what you've noticed in the past, or if there's been any trend um, coming from that, from those employment patterns. Very briefly, there's no question that we are becoming more diverse as a state and as a nation, it's happening. There's no question that awareness of diversity and awareness of cultural awareness is becoming more and more important. Uh, both to those who run companies and to the citizenry at large. So absolutely, yes, I think that has definitely been the trend and is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. I have found that um, a lot of our new caregivers that have just graduated college, which is what you're referring to, right? When they come from different states, they are in shock. Um, we just had one. I, I take the time to ask, uh, what have you observed in the last five days that you've been here in Rapid City? People who come from the East Coast are surprised at how we smile at each other and wave at random strangers. It's a shock to them, and it's not based on race. They're predominantly uh, uh, white caregivers. Um, people who come from Minnesota, we just had a lady from Minnesota who could not believe that we were so different and was in shock. We had to help her settle in. She was a young white female. We see constantly that as a nation, we're very different in our different environments. And when people come in, sometimes that, that we have to help them because they're just not used to uh, some of the things that we do. People who've come from Chicago where uh, guns are not allowed anywhere they, they almost pass out when they get into Walmart and you can open carry. They just almost pass out. They don't know if they're safe. I mean, I could go on and on with the examples we get and what makes people almost hyperventilate. We can teach it, we can educate. There's certain things that when they get in, they have to learn. And so the goal is always having people who can walk them through those difficulties when they come. Other comments? Thank you. Thank you. Now, tomorrow we're going to have a presentation from the uh, uh, diversity centers that we have in South Dakota. We have, we have three, uh, all of the campuses have an emphasis on diversity. Uh, three of the campuses, SDSU, USD, and Mines, have diversity centers called one thing or another. But I'm wondering if any of you have any uh, contact with those folks or, or any, any idea of, if it's uh, uh, something that you're aware of that we have that we are trying to do. If you, if you are aware of it and if you are, whether or not you believe it to be helpful. And maybe there's no contact and I'm not suggesting that's a bad thing. We'll find out more from those folks tomorrow. Well, I'll wade in here briefly. Um, certainly, uh, having gone to uh, an institution in South Dakota, I'm familiar with the fact that the diversity offices exist um, outside of whether there's regular business interaction with those entities. I would say largely no, there's not. But I don't know that that's necessarily inherently a bad thing either. But I think one, one comment I'll make about that is part of the reason why we're here today is because of the focus that has been placed on those entities. I mean, it's been in the media, it's been covered uh, for the last number of months. It was a topic of conversation at great length during the 2019 legislative session. And so when I you know, referenced the intersection of politics and policy earlier, that's really what I'm talking about. And so I think that uh, I mostly made my comments, but I'll just reiterate them here is that as you're having these conversation about diversity offices on university campuses, it is absolutely essential to keep in mind that 
political component as part of the conversation. Again, not to politicize our universities. I mean, we, these are publicly funded entities in large part, and so it needs to serve the citizenry of the state as a whole. But if, in order to navigate that fine line that we talked about before, have to think about the way in which those entities are communicating, not just externally, but internally as well. Uh, that has been a subject of no small amount of conversation in the legislative process over the last couple of years and is going to continue to be as long as the disconnect between the messages that are intended, again, the goal that I referenced earlier, and the way in which they are conveyed continues to exist. Thank you. Any other? Uh, I just, I wanted to make reference that the SDSU Diversity Office, uh, my friends I think back there, uh, they came to, to visit uh, Raven here on Friday to share more about um, their overall mission through the Diversity Office uh, and explain kind of their role on campus. Uh, and it was very enlightening. I, I appreciated the conversation that we had uh, and how they can look to better prepare students um, for, for the future for us as employers. Thank you. Mr. Owen? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to close on a, on a positive note. To answer your question directly, I, I get caught up with statewide policies and business, and I can tell you more about how your property taxes are calculated than, than you want to sit through, because everybody I've told that says they didn't need that information. <laughs> um, and, and so that, um, and sales and use tax is even more fascinating for about three of us in the state. I've only found one of the other two. Um, I, I want to I share this. Um, we live in Sioux Falls, and um, my youngest is a 14-year-old freshman at Washington High who went to Whittier Middle School, which is a majority-minority school. I went to Annie Sullivan. We're living diversity and we're doing really well. And I take you back to his second grade class. I was forcing him to think about all of the kids and all the skin color there and I was acting like a ass. Um, and I said, well, how many white kids in your class? He goes, I don't know most of them. I saw the class picture, <laughs> 21 kids, four Caucasians. He didn't know. He is purely colorblind because he was at school with them all day, every day. The only thing that he resents is that native Spanish speakers are kicking his butt in Spanish class. <laughs> I had the opportunity of visiting a School of Mines, um, their inclusion office. When, you walk, when I walked onto the campus, I opened my eyes to see the differences that existed with the students and the rooms they were reading in and studying in and getting to speak with uh, Jesse Herrera extensively. Um, we need those. We need places where students can go. We need offices that can help our students, places that are safe and can put together events and programs for the students. And so I was personally quite pleased with what I saw and I'm thankful for you all asking us to speak because all of a sudden I'm now aware of um, you know, what we have right in my own town that I was not even aware of. And so that's another opportunity for us to even partner together and work together. And so I really appreciate you asking us to come and speak. Thank you for that. Question? Um, yeah, uh, my name is, oh, sorry, it, is Marissa Guillory. I'm a student here at DSU. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the value of diversity offices here today. Um, here at DSU, we do not have a diversity office. Uh, it's something that uh, myself and many other students have been trying to uh, get created for a number of years now. Um, I know many students on this campus who uh, identify uh, as part of minority groups uh, or as the diverse population on campus feel like the lack of that office makes it 
more difficult to be heard on campus and succeed on campus. I would like to know um, your opinions as far as um, if you think that the lack of this office and support for that programming would also put students from this university at a disadvantage uh, after their collegiate life. Somebody's got to take a stab at that one. Um, I was thinking about the, the question, previous question about the diversity offices on campus as well. And um, the folks from the office at SDSU also have also visited us and shared about that, the activities and the challenges that they see students having that they're able to address. I believe that you know, each of us is unique and each student brings their own unique set of challenges and some have really quite a lot of challenges that benefit from having a, a, a group or a focus that has a focus on helping students who are not, don't have another place to get help from. My daughter was a student at USD and she was active in the organizations that are part of the Center for Diversity and community is the way that it's described there. And it was highly valuable for, for them. My daughter went by uh, the pronoun them. Extremely important from my perspective as I listen to what kinds of activities that uh, entity does and then the way that they created a welcoming space for students. And we've talked about how we want our organizations to be welcoming for the employees who work there it creates a experience that helps them stay in school but also creates a model for how to build a welcoming environment. I think they are quite influential positively. I wouldn't judge the campus or a student coming from the campus by whether or not they had a center, but I would anticipate that having a center would make it more likely that more students would more fully be successful in their experience. And any conversation related to the creation of a new uh, office or adding more staff at the university, it's not just as simple as the topic at hand, right? I mean, there's the political reality, there's the, the cost, there's uh, the, how does it fit within the institution reality, that kind of thing. Uh, going back to my conversation from, or comments from earlier, I think the most valuable piece of your university education when it comes to diversity is the fact that you got one. That is the more important factor than it is whether your university has a diversity office or whether it doesn't. And I don't just mean, I mean, I know we're at a Board of Regents meeting, but I don't just mean like the regental institutions in the state of South Dakota either. I mean, any type of post-secondary education is gonna be a differentiator there on your understanding and knowledge of diversity, most likely, more than whether or not Dakota State has a diversity office or doesn't have one, but SDSU does and USD does and Mines does, but Black Hill State doesn't. An another way that I hear your question is, is having a separate diversity office the only way to address diversity at each campus? And, and I logically think no, but you're right. If the university president and the faculty aren't addressing diversity somehow, um, that's bad. And if you're at an institution that gets labeled in the soundbite world as a bigoted institution, um, you're, you're going to be coming from behind. So I don't know that it needs a separate office. I've watched budget problems enough. But the effort has to be there. Uh, President Rankin and I were talking, and he talked about the importance of making sure that his students all felt very welcome and that the students had safe spaces uh, to thrive. You are also right, it's so hard, you can't say create an office everywhere because we're thinking budgets and all those other things and so we cannot speak to what your budget looks like. 
but ensuring that organizations, institutions, universities find a way to ensure that there's that safe space, that people can connect, that people can thrive, that people can blossom, that people can walk around campus with their heads held high and thrive and enjoy their environment. How they do that, I don't know, um, but it is very important. Anyone else on that question? Thank you. Regent Thurs? Yes, <clears throat> I guess I'd like to, some comments that I, I, mean, I think diversity has been part of our country for a long time. Uh, I own a ranch in Wyoming and, and had an old coal mine town, and in the late 1800s, uh, 12, 1500 residents, 20 some different nationalities worked in that mine. I read nothing that says there was major clashes with culture. They found a way to work through it. My grandfather came through Ellis Island and right at the turn of the century, a, a German from Russia knew no English. Uh, but found a way to be part of society and, and be productive in our country. And I think what's changed is really our immigration patterns and where our, our immigrants really in the last 10, 20 years or so have come from different areas of, our, of the world. And I think what's really the most important as that has changed is making sure we understand and respect those new cultures. I think that's where a lot of our problem, at least I see that in our community in Aberdeen, where these different cultures, different places have come in, and it's understanding and, and learning how to respect those different cultures. That's the biggest challenge, in my opinion. Any comments or thoughts on that? Any other questions by anyone? Thank you all for being here, uh, we do find ourselves as a Board of Regents at the intersection of politics and public policy, and that never seems to go away. And this is certainly a, a, an issue that's important to a lot of people in South Dakota on either sides of it. And uh, we are going forward uh, with more knowledge about the issues thanks to your participation today. So thank, thank all of you very much for being here. We will reconvene at five o'clock for community forum.
Pardon me, everybody. I hate to break up a party, but uh, we need the regents up here. Please, regents, come up and get in line. All right, everyone, we, uh, this is our open forum. Uh, at all our meetings, we gather in front of you all and take questions. Uh, I have the mic now, uh, as I'm the uh, local regent, so I get to host this forum, but that also means that I get to pass off the mic for any questions that I really don't want to answer. So uh, anyway, I uh, want to just take this opportunity to thank uh, DSU President Griffiths and you all for a uh, great showing at the open forum. Sometimes we don't get this kind of uh, attendance, so we appreciate you all being here. So now the first uh, order of business is to take the first question. Maybe we to oh yeah, sure, sorry, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll start here since I have the mic. I'm, of course, Regent Schaefer from Madison. Uh, I've been on the Regents now for 10 years, seems like 30. <laughs> and I'm Barb Stork, and I'm from Dakota Dunes, and I'm just brand new and learning. Jim Morgan, Regent for Brookings. I've been on uh, Regents about four years. John Bastian from Belfouche, about four years. Joan Wink, I live near Howes. Three people now live in Howes, and I know all of them. Keep that mic. Keep that mic. And I'm supposed to keep this mic. And this is my third year. <laughs> I'm Lucas Lund. I'm a student at the University of South Dakota, student regent on the board. Um, originally from Sioux Falls, and this is the beginning of my second year on the board. I'm Jim Thayers. I'm from Aberdeen, and I've been on the board about two and a half years. And I'm Paul Barron. I'm the executive director and CEO of the Board of Regents, and I am in my second year. And I live in Pierre, which is in the center of the state and close to nothing. Director Barron, you can keep that mic since you're the, at a different pay grade than everybody else here. You'll probably get to answer most of the questions. Uh, so go ahead. We're looking for uh, anybody that has anything on their mind. Good news, bad news. We're going to stand there till someone starts. Yes, sir. Hello there. Thank you for the question. You're testing an old man's memory, so I'm going to have to pass that on. Let me, yeah. So uh, the answer to that question is we have been, uh, I've uh, been working with Dave Flute, who is the uh, Secretary for Indian Affairs. Um, <clears throat> we're in the process of getting, we're about to start a process of getting out to the reservations, and going, out, going to all the tribal schools, uh, tribal colleges. Uh, we have uh, two proposals in front of the governor for her uh, consideration uh, to be included in the budget, and both of them uh, essentially create centers for American Indian Studies, uh, one at Northern and one at Black Hills, Black Hills uh, State University, who actually Black Hills State University has the highest American Indian population uh, percentage-wise in the state, so they're looking to start a center specifically. That would, that would create opportunity, named opportunity at, at I think, every campus in, in, our, in our regional system. So that's one way. Um, they also have been included as we, as we have presented the Dakota's Promise and moved that forward. That has included the regional, the six universities in the Board of Regents system, uh, the private universities, and the tribal colleges. So uh, that's another way that we have acted on that. Um, the, the, the purpose of the law really was to formalize and, and, and move forward some, uh, any number of relationships that we can build to create uh, bonds with the American Indian population and American Indian higher education.
I knew you would, Rich. Dr. Perry, do you want to? I saw you back there, and I think your best to answer that question. In the, the gen ed requirements, uh, where you're able to, um, each school forms their own, and then choose what you want to take out. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. I think I'm Jay Perry, the uh, Vice President of Practical Affairs. The thought process behind that was that that we established the six goal areas. Everybody, um, every student having to take at least one course or three credits from each of those, and then letting there be some flexibility among the campuses to define how they wanted to allocate the rest of those credits because when we, when we made the changes to general education, we eliminated the institutional graduation requirement general education courses, and there were multiple campuses who were adamant that uh, some of those courses and those requirements were what drove the identity of their institutions, and so we wanted to preserve the ability for institutions to keep that if they so choose. Now, in the end, we ended up with six identical uh, distributions of, of those credits, um, but that is for today, and if tomorrow there's a movement on a campus to, to change that, we certainly would, would entertain that, but that, that was the idea. Not at that point, no. It was, it was trying to give the latitude. We, we, we knew we needed a system approach because we have the common transcript and the common course catalog, uh, but also trying to preserve some of that flexibility at the same time. Thank you, Dr. Perry. So I was just given an assignment, uh, <laughs> and that is to talk a little bit about um, uh, Regent Schaefer is from Madison and graduated from here and men, the preponderance of people in the room are, are connected to Madison somehow. And so the, que the question was that, uh, that Regent Schaefer posed to me, you know, can I talk a little bit about how DSU fits into the, the big scheme of the, the regional universities, all, all, of, the, all of the six universities and, and kind of how we see uh, DSU, and I'm, so I'm, I'm taking the liberty of speaking for the collective board in this answer, but from my, ob but, but, but really what I'm, I'm, I'm really not, I'm really talking about myself and my own observation over the last year, because <laughs> over the last year learning about the Board of Regents system, going to all the universities multiple times, being on the campuses, uh, getting to know the presidents, um, getting to uh, see the different things and the different focuses of the institutions. Uh, one of the things that has, that I think about uh, Dakota State is that it is in a very unique position. Uh, first of all, I can't say enough positive things about Dr. Griffiths. I think she is a brilliant person, uh, a phenomenal um, uh, perspective about technology and education and um, the, the cyber world, and she is phenomenally connected to uh, lots of resources, and that is really good, and it's, and it's paid off for this institution in multiple ways. You also have a number of excellent faculty who have been here for a long time, and some who have been here for a short time, but they all, from my conversations with, with the faculty across the institution, my summary of it is, is that everybody is very committed to this institution and to this community. And I, I think when you talk about, about the longevity of opportunity, separate from people, but bigger than people, the longevity of opportunity has a great, it, it is alive and well here at this campus. I mean, just look at this building Look at, the, look at the faith that the, the state and, and, and some of the leaders of the state have taken uh, in, in relationship to giving uh, and donating philanthropically to make this 
to improve this campus, to make this campus really a, a shining star in terms of cyber, in terms of uh, technology. And so I would say that this is, that Dakota State University is the, um, uh, it's an emerging star in the system. It has a very focused mission, or it has taken on a very focused mission, yet at the same time, what is creating the, uh, the opportunity for that very focused mission to grow, that, that technology mission, that, that cyber mission, is a very strong set, a very strong mix of the liberal arts, of arts and science, all the things that create the milieu of a, of, of a university that creates creative thinking, critical thinking, and all those things. The other strength about DSU is the fact that it is, uh, as four of our universities are, a relatively small university, which creates a, an intimacy of knowledge, uh, interaction and, in, in, and interplay among the faculty and the students and among the, and from student to student in terms of their relationships with each other and how they learn from each other. So I think there is a tremendous amount of power in learning going on at DSU right now and will continue because it's really got it's really got its foot in the door in terms of stepping up the speed of being able to do some phenomenal things. So that's my perspective. Thank you. You know, I think we've been saying here for about 10 years that we're the, uh, we're the best kept secret out there in the country, and now we maybe are moving from best kept secret to emerging star. Uh, that's a nice way to put that. Looking for more questions. Mr. Olson. I'm really tempted to ask something about research projects and why Twitter shares. No. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, well, we actually addressed that very issue uh, this morning. Uh, at your alma mater, for example, uh, retention was 72% from freshman to sophomore. We all recognize that's not good enough. And it's, you know, unfortunate that it took us to hit that number, to go from 80 to 78 to 72. Now we've, uh, just in the last, I don't know, what year? Two, three, what was it? at USD, that retention has moved to, 78, 76. it's 78 now, it's plus, yeah. So it's moved from 72 something to 78%, that's retention of freshmen to sophomore, and that's not an accident. Uh, they have, they've specifically uh, implemented a program that she called Coyote, Coyote Connection. Connection. That's just one example, and it has to, that, that example has to be carried out in every university, because you're exactly right. The, the, the old, uh, I'm, I'm your faculty, I'm an, and I'm your advisor, and you're an adult, and you need to show up or ship out, is not going to cut it uh, in higher ed anymore. We recognize that. 78, she's taken a part. Uh, it was 72%. It was 72 in 2017. It's now jumped to 78. Two short years. I mean, that's amazing. And, and this was really, I'm sorry. And this actually started to be addressed at the last meeting when we talked about how many advisors and, and life coaches, people who uh, are helping students over, you know, I'm older than you are, so I, I can remember, you know, going to the, f figuring out how I could figure out my course schedule and not have to talk to anybody. 
and, uh, and, and just and get it passed. <clears throat> Nowadays, what we're trying to do is reach out not only to worry about course schedules and make sure students are on track to graduate, all those kind of things. We're worried about, so how are, are you showing up for class? And if you don't show up for class and you don't turn in assignments, instead of waiting until midterm, we're calling them up about the, about the time that the assignment's due and they don't turn it in. We're trying to call them up and we're trying to make contact with them. We're trying to, to help them to understand their responsibility to get, the, to get that work done. And also ask them, is there a problem? Is there something we can help you with? And in fact, we have employed, the system has employed over the last four years, any, about 200, I think, uh, across the system, across the six universities, uh, uh, advisors, um, life coaches, uh, they can be named a whole, whole variety of things, but they're not just about academic advising, they're really about helping students become successful at being students, which goes beyond what ha they have to do in the classroom. And in fact, tomorrow we have a report on the summary of what, have, what that has meant for our budget and what that, co and what that costs us. But what it brings us for the cost that it takes is that in, are those increased um, levels of success that our students are having, and, and if you think and if you think out and multiply out, going from seventy two percent to going to seventy seventy eight percent. She's got another number. She got okay. another number here for you. The four year graduate graduation rate, which has all of our attention, um, in twenty ten USD, the four year graduate graduation rate was 18.3. Uh, this year it's 40%, which hurts those overall numbers because she keeps them a shorter time. You see how? But the graduation rate is much, much to 40%. It's amazing to me. You really, this is really for you. <laughs> I mean, you'll be interested in it. Thank you for your question, Russ. Next. We're down to our last five minutes or so before we get to go uh, on our little field trip. So uh, don't miss an opportunity. You are very quiet. What have we done to you? You were all bustling and talking before we started this. Yes, sir. So with those uh, life coaches and such, um, I've heard that a lot of those, at least on our campus here at CSU, are funded through grants and that they don't have long-term funding to keep those positions uh, here. Uh, as a student, I, in 2016, as a freshman, had that same thing. My professor was my Yeah, that's a great question. That's, um, frankly, that's the president's um, job to make sure that she's allocating funds in the best way that she can for, her, for a university. She's got to spread uh, a little money over a, a lot of places at, at universities, in, at all six universities. So I can't really speak specifically to what Dakota State is doing in that regard, but I don't know if there's anybody in here that could, but um, it's something that's on the president's mind, not only here, but on, at every university campus. Uh, we've seen success in that kind of life coach thing, uh, or professional advisors, so it's, it's on the radar, I know that. Uh, anybody have any better information? Jay? Uh, thanks, Jay Perry. Again, we're just a little early because tomorrow this uh, exact topic is in one of your uh, items. But I, I know at Dakota State right now, there are six full-time advisors. Um, and of those, 
Um, well, say that we're spending about $350,000 on advisors at the university that are professional advisors, not faculty, uh, and 89000 of that is coming either from uh, grants or uh, private gifts, which, you know, ballpark um, is about 25% of what the university is spending. And so, you know, whether that there's a way to find that to make that sustainable, that is one of the board's ongoing discussions, and it's one of the reasons why we have this uh, item that where we talk about uh, the impact that professional advisors have been having in the system. So I, I know we brought forth as a system, different institutions, including Dakota State, have brought forth several uh, packages to the legislature in the last couple of years, and we, quite frankly, have not had much success getting those funded, but it is something we're going to have to keep talking about and keep trying to find a way to get through. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Looking for one last question or comment. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what, what, what you just said at the end there was probably the way we'll, we'll proceed with that. We'd like to have more conversation with you on that. Um, there's a, yeah. All right, I think we're ready to go. We'll probably, Regents will take a quick short break before we take off on our field trip. And thank you all for coming. It was a good conversation.